In this presentation, the treatment of a Liz Frank injury will be demonstrated using open reduction and internal fixation ORIF, with 4.0 mm self-tapping cortex screws and a first TMT fusion plate 2.4-2.7 VA locking. Here we see examples of an AP and oblique view of a Liz Frank injury. In the AP view, it can be seen that the first MT is tipped off the medial cuneiform and the first TMT is tipped out of place. The 30-degree oblique view shows the second TMT displaced laterally. In the event of a high-energy injury, the lateral profile might also be displaced with the MTs elevated. Upon completion of this exercise, you should be able to Recognize the biomechanics and injury patterns for surgery versus closed treatment. Perform the surgical reduction and fixation. And describe the post-operative rehabilitation. Clinical indications include failed closed reduction and percutaneous pin fixation, fractures presenting with any evidence of instability, in other words, measuring greater than 2 mm of displacement, and 15 degrees of TMT angulation, bony fracture dislocations, ligamentous arch injuries, delayed treatment, and chronic deformity. The patient is positioned supine. The surgeon is seated near the foot of the table and might move from medial to lateral depending on whether working from dorsomedial, from dorsolateral, or from distal. The bone model is secured in the clamp. The bone spreader is used to show the simulated medial column instability between the first and second metatarsal. The simulated attachment is stretched. The chisel is used to release this simulated attachment. The simulated intertarsal instability and instability of the base of the second metatarsal from the medial cuneiform can be seen. If there is additional instability more proximally, it would possibly be in the region of the intermetatarsal area between medial and intermediate cuneiform here, between the middle and the lateral cuneiform here, and even along the navicular cuneiform level here. This additional instability must be addressed before a definitive ORIF can be completed. In the case of intercuneiform instability, a K-wire can be inserted for provisional stabilization before the definitive ORIF is performed. The K-wire is inserted from the medial cuneiform and directed rather dorsal because there are a number of structures more plantar that should be avoided. The K-wire has addressed the instability between the cuneiforms, but not the Lisfranc instability, which is located here. So the next step is to address the Lisfranc instability. A K-wire is used to create a small conical recess in the cortex to seat the point of the reduction forceps. A second recess is created in the cortex of the medial cuneiform. The large pointed reduction forceps is applied and the Liz Frank injury is reduced by tightening the forceps. The reduction is secured with the ratchet lock. The Liz Frank instability has now been addressed. It can be seen that the base of the second metatarsal has been seated into this keystone corner here. The next step will be to fix the reduction with a self-tapping cortex screw inserted as a lag screw from the medial cuneiform to the base of the second metatarsal. This screw has a 4.0 mm thread diameter and a 2.9 mm core diameter. It is important to note that the thread hole will be drilled using a 2.5 mm drill bit through the 2.9 mm sleeve and that the bone is very soft. 
It is not really hard cortical bone, but rather soft cancellous bone, more like a shell with a soft interior. Since the thread hole is smaller than the core diameter of the screw, the screw will radially push the cancellous bone outward. This differs from standard AO technique, in which the thread hole is drilled to the core diameter of the screw. The screw is inserted a little plantar and aimed a little superior. The 4.0mm glide hole is drilled in the medial cuneiform through the 4.0 end of the double drill guide. The 2.5mm drill bit is slid through the 2.9 end of the double drill guide and inserted into the 4.0mm hole to guide the insertion of the drill guide. The end of the drill guide is wriggled into the 4.0mm hole to guide the insertion of the 2.5mm drill bit. After the hole has been drilled, the 2.9mm end of the double drill guide is wriggled out of the 4.0mm hole. The depth is measured with the depth gauge. In this case, the depth is 34mm. The appropriate length self-tapping 4.0mm cortex screw is inserted. As this is a lag screw, the base of the second metatarsal is pulled toward the medial cuneiform. The pointed reduction forceps are removed. The next step is to address the reduction of the first TMT joint. To provide increased leverage and prevent cortical break-off, the burr will be used to create a pocket hole for the head of the screw at a distance of 2 cm from the joint. A 4.0 mm screw will be inserted across the joint using the previously described technique. It is important to note that the bone is very soft. It is not really hard cortical bone, but rather soft cancellous bone, more like a shell with a soft interior. Since the thread hole is smaller than the core diameter of the screw, the screw will radially push the cancellous bone outward. This differs from standard AO technique, in which the thread hole is drilled to the core diameter of the screw. Two centimeters are measured from the joint and marked on the bone. A burr of sufficient size to create the pocket hole is used. Here, a burr of 5 mm is used. In the clinic, a burr with a diameter of 6 mm or 8 mm might also be used. To help with visualization, the pocket hole has been marked in red. The 4.0 mm glide hole is drilled to the base of the first TMT joint. The tip is aimed plantar medial to exit the corner of the medial cuneiform. The 2.9 end of the double drill guide is wriggled into the 4.0 mm hole to guide the insertion of the 2.5 mm drill bit. A 2.5 mm thread hole is drilled from the base of the first TMT joint to the plantar medial corner of the base of the medial cuneiform. After the hole has been drilled, the 2.9 mm end of the double drill guide is wriggled out of the 4.0 mm hole. The depth is measured. In this case, 
the length is 44 millimeters. The appropriate length self-tapping 4.0 millimeter Cortex screw is inserted. For the purpose of this exercise, to prevent rotation, one participant can stabilize the first TMT while the screw is inserted. As an option, if the second TMT is very unstable, a K-wire can be inserted for temporary fixation, or in the clinic, an appropriate diameter screw can be inserted using the previously described technique. In this case, it's stable enough that a K-wire is not needed. The next step is to address the reduction of the third TMT joint. The previously described technique is repeated. A pocket hole for the screw head is made with the burr and marked in red. In the clinical setting, there may be indication where a smaller diameter screw is advisable for the third MT. The screw can be aimed for the lateral cuneiform. The assistant provides stabilization distally. It can be seen that the trajectory is very flat, as a more vertical trajectory would miss the bottom of the cuneiform. The 4.0 mm glide hole is drilled to the base of the third TMT joint. The 2.9 end of the double drill guide is wriggled into the 4.0 mm hole to guide the insertion of the 2.5 mm drill bit. A 2.5 mm thread hole is drilled from the base of the third TMT joint to the base of the lateral cuneiform. The end of the double drill guide is wriggled out of the hole. The depth is measured. Screws can be inserted into the navicular to further stabilize the foot in the case of intertarsal instability. The appropriate length self-tapping 4.0 mm cortex screw is inserted. These screws have been inserted as lag screws because with these non-essential joints, stiffening or even auto-fusing is acceptable as motion need not be maintained here, especially in a post-traumatic injury. In many instances, fusion can actually be desirable. The remaining K-wire is removed. If there is comminution of the base of the second metatarsal that precludes the use of a screw from the medial cuneiform to the second MT, a dorsal spanning plate may be used. Plates can also be used to salvage a failed pocket hole. The plates include the TMT fusion plate 2.4-2.7 VA locking and the first TMT fusion plate 2.4-2.7 VA locking, which will be shown. The plate is positioned and provisionally attached using the compression wires. The compression forceps can then be used to provide additional compression if needed. Either a coaxial or variable angle drill guide may be utilized with the 2.0 mm drill bit to prepare the screw holes for the locking screws. The conical variable angle drill guide allows for 15 degrees off of center in any direction. The variable angle technique can be used to direct some of the plate screws into the intercuneiform area and some of the screws all the way across the intertarsal region for greater construct stability. The screws will be inserted in the following order. The first screw hole is drilled using the conical VA LCP drill sleeve to direct the 2.0 mm drill bit into the intertarsal region. In the clinical setting, the desired angle would be verified under image intensification.
The drill sleeve is removed. The screw hole is measured with the depth gauge to determine the length of the screw. A self-tapping 2.7mm VA locking screw is inserted using the star drive screwdriver shaft and torque limiting handle. The second screw hole is drilled nominally using the 2.7mm drill sleeve to direct the 2.0mm drill bit. A self-tapping 2.7mm VA locking screw of the appropriate length is inserted using the star drive screwdriver shaft and torque limiting handle. The compression wires are removed. The remaining screw holes are drilled, measured and filled with 2.7mm VA locking screws. The completed construct is shown here. Clinically, it may be possible to use differing combinations of screws and plates. Here, a TMT fusion plate 2.4-2.7 VA locking has been secured to the second ray using a compression wire. A comminuted area is indicated in blue at the base of the second metatarsal. In this case, the TMT fusion plate would be inappropriate as the most proximal screw in the distal plate segment would fall into the comminuted area and would not obtain purchase in the bone. A longer plate would be needed to cross the comminuted area and allow for sufficient screw purchase in the distal plate segment. Here, a T fusion plate 2.4, 2.7 is shown. It can be seen in profile that the plate will need to be plantar flexed to fit the anatomy. After contouring, the T-fusion plate has been secured to the second ray with a compression wire. It can be seen that there are a sufficient number of screw holes in the distal end of the plate. Here we see the post-operative weight-bearing AP, lateral and oblique views from a clinical case, in which a Lisfranc injury was treated with plate fixation. In the AP view, we can see that the first TMT is fixed with the plate and side screws. The lateral view shows there is excellent alignment with no dorsal displacement. In the oblique view, the reduction at the base of the second and third metatarsals can be seen. The lateral border of the base of the second metatarsal aligns with the lateral base of the intermediate cuneiform and the base of the third metatarsal aligns with the lateral border of the lateral cuneiform. Post-operative care includes a plaster splint for two weeks, a controlled ankle motion boot with controlled range of motion but strict non-weight bearing for six to 12 weeks, progressive weight bearing with possible removal of hardware at three or more months or allow hardware to remain in place as these are non-essential joints and removal of K-wires if used after six to eight weeks. You should now be able to recognize the biomechanics and injury patterns for surgery versus closed treatment, perform the surgical reduction and fixation, and describe the postoperative rehabilitation.